cancel anytime within the
Uh, all right, hi guys. Sorry about that. There was a technical issue on the connection. All right. Okay, I see people are joining. People are joining. Um, how's the sound going? How's the sound? How's the uh, video? Is everyone happy with the sound? Is everyone happy with the video? Can I get some thumbs up on the sound, please? Hi guys, anyone, anyone can, uh, what to call, can you guys hear me? Can I just get a thumbs up? Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Okay, from Facebook, the sound is good. Anyone from YouTube, how's the sound? Happy with the sound, happy with the video on YouTube and we are okay on Facebook. All right, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Cool. All right, let's go. Let's get this show started. Welcome to the Artisan to Manager Accelerator online seminar. Uh, my name is Nkulego Tusini, and I'm going to be your facilitator today. So the reason why we're here is, well, first of all, first of all, we had a an invite which we've shared with a lot of people to say, listen, come and join this um, online uh, seminar and the target market being artisans. So what we're trying to achieve here is to provide artisans with information on the essential steps that they need to take to advance their careers from moving from an artisan to a manager. So you're probably thinking, well, okay, maybe I don't wanna be a manager or I just wanna advance my career in a different field. And this is what's gonna be covered in today's seminar. And I'm gonna be looking at different things and I'll let you know exactly what, um, what to call I'll be looking at. So the other important thing is to understand why, how, or why did we get to this point as Palucraft? So there was a combination of things. The first of, the first of which was our past students. So if you don't know who Palucraft is, I'll let you know later, but just take this for now. Our past students, who were doing um, either our GCC factories courses or were using our GCC factories books, um, they will all they will come back and say, "Listen, I've I've passed my GCC factories. Fantastic, I love it, but I'm an artisan, and it seems like I'm being overlooked for uh, for a lot of these GMR 2.1 appointments. What could be the reason, right? So this seminar." is going to try to answer some of those reasons and possibly give some of the solutions on how we can move forward in terms of in terms of uh what you call uh in in terms of securing that gmr 2.1 position so the other problem that we experienced the other problem that we experienced, uh, sorry guys, this seems to be not scrolling. Oh, all right, cool. So our students were getting rejection after rejection, um, even if even when they had their GMR, uh, sorry, not their GMR, but their GCC factories, and we had to understand why they get all these rejections. Now, from my personal experience, I've I've interviewed a lot of artisans for possible positions for supervisors and manager roles. And what I found was that like the technical reasoning, the, um, the leadership and general management skills were lacking a lot from, uh, from many of the artisans. And it becomes very difficult for, for management, even um, higher up your senior managers and whatever, to justify hiring some of the artisans for some of these um, like GMR 2.1 or 231. Um, point one um, appointments or management appointments in general, because you will you'll be sitting in an interview and you'll be asking, you know, very technical questions, which you would expect a person who will be filling that supervisor role or management role to be able to address. Because remember that a supervisor or management role is also a leadership role. So you need somebody who, when they are fulfilling that role, they're able to 
guide and lead the junior team and the other skilled laborers and artisans. So the third problem was, or the third thing that led to us developing this online seminar was that we had plenty of uh, queries from artisans on, get, on how to get GCC factories and how to use GCC factories um, to get higher salaries and so forth. So my view is the minute you're trying to get the GCC factories or the GCC mines and work, or you're trying to get any professional certification. Uh, and if that reason is because of money, then it tends, your, your goals tend to be very vague because what will happen is you will get more money and you will never be fulfilled and you want more money and more money and more money and more money and more money. And, more money and it will be just an endless journey of frustration your whole life. So with a vague with vague goals then you will start having you start being all over the place in terms of what exactly you're doing so this is where you find um you know um an, an, a boiler maker ending up wanting to be a qualified welder wanting to be a qualified fitter and then they want to get it the, then all of a sudden they they want to get a diploma in civil engineering so now you end up being all over the place because your goals are very vague and they're influenced by like a like something small like a salary uh which of which a salary is just an ends to a means so you'll never be very like um like fulfilled in your career if your goals are vague and if your goals are vague you'll be all over the place and you won't be able to plan your career properly so that was the third thing that sort of influenced this seminar the other thing that uh, the last thing that influenced the seminar was a session we had on the 11th of feb 2021 which is this year uh it was last week which was a gcc online seminar and during the q a sessions it became very clear that I will what one one point that I made was I will I will never hire an artisan as a manager. And I know that is very controversial to say right now because a lot of the people right now are artisans. And the reason why I said that during that seminar was because there were of the reasons that I've already mentioned now and reasons that I'm going to illustrate in today's seminar. So but I didn't I don't want to make that blanket statement and say I will never hire an artisan as a manager. So I will hire them unless they do a couple of things. And those couple of things that they need to do is what we're gonna be talking about today. So it's not entirely your fault that there's these deficiencies and there's these vague goals and you you don't really have a like a cohesive plan on how you're gonna achieve your goals not your fault at all so from the diagnosis that we've done we, we saw that okay let's look at the problem statement what are the real issues what are the problems exactly so the first big problem in my view is that a lot of artisans don't have role models um, they don't have mentors and they don't have career coaches a lot of artisans have very vague career goals which makes their professional development plans even more vague. So if you've got a vague goal, then you will have a vague professional development plan. And the other thing that, the last thing that I've, uh, I've noted and we've noted from our research is that a lot of artisans lack the broader skills in as far as management, communication and leadership is concerned. So, with these problem statements, I'm, you should by now have a clue on what will be covered in this in today's session and how what you call this this session will feed or try to address these problems. So I wouldn't be a good engineer if I just gave you problems without solutions. So in today's session, the solutions will be dealt with systematically. So the first thing is you as an artisan sitting there and listening to the session you need to admit that you don't know what you don't know that's we the, that's the first step the second step you need to get help and that help will help you reveal some of the knowledge gaps that you need to advance with your career step three 
is define is defining a developmental develop the developmental gaps, right? So the developmental gaps will be if I know what my knowledge gaps are, then I I need to then say how do I how do I address these knowledge gaps. And the last step is addressing the developmental goal. So it's defining the, your goals and then addressing sorry defining the gaps and then addressing the gaps. So all of this will be done very systematically, and I will explain in the next slide how we're gonna cover this. So our agenda today is, I'm just gonna quickly, so that was the broad introduction that I just gave. Um, after this broad introduction, I just wanna talk about who I am so that you understand um, why would I be the right person to be giving this sort of seminar and what influences or influenced uh, me taking this direction of being a facilitator and helping people um, advance their careers. And then I'll talk a little bit about who Paddlecraft is. So I'll be very quick on those two things because we want to cover the core elements. But I think with the introduction that I just gave, you already or you should already have a bit of a picture on what we're going to be doing what we're going to be doing today. So the first thing that I said we'll do is knowing that you don't know. So the things that we're going to talk about there is the mental barriers and the limiting beliefs. We're going to talk about the common skills deficiencies that artisans have. We're going to talk about why you're not getting that job as an artisan. And by that job, I'm talking about moving up higher in the corporate ladder in the technical field, like moving to supervisor or moving from foreman slash supervisor to manager to engineering manager and so forth, right? So we're gonna talk about those um, those things that influence why you're not getting these jobs. Then we're gonna go to step two. And then under step two, um, is the seek help and reveal your knowledge gap. So the specific things that we're gonna talk about there is the artisan career paths. So it's very important to understand the different career paths that, in, that you can take as an artisan. So once you understand the career paths, then you can start identifying what gaps you need to fill and then to, to, to what gaps you need to fill to get to supervisor level and what gaps you need to fill to get to management level. Now, step three of today's session is defining the developmental gap. So now I'm going to try to guide you on how to decide which career path to take. So this is now setting that career goal, right? Then I'm going to help you define your professional development plan. So this is now your career plan on what, what are the, the specific things that you need to do. Then step four is addressing these developmental gaps. So there, we're going to talk about how to write a better CV that will make you stand out and actually secure that position. We'll talk about how to give a better interview. And lastly, we'll talk about how to gain these critical skills. Guys, this, the last step, I'm very excited about it. So just keep keep on uh keep on listening to this online seminar and i promise you the last step will just blow your mind so quickly guys who am i i'm kulego tusini and i love sharing information and i love skills development so i help a lot of artisans um, uh, technicians and engineers decide on what sort of career path they can take i mentor a lot of junior guys and i i help people define and strive in their careers, specifically in the engineering space. So I'm the CEO of Pilotcraft and the founder of Pilotcraft. I am a mechanical engineer by profession. And my qualifications are, I've got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering um, and a master's in engineering management from UJ. Are, are there any people from UJ today? Can I have a thumbs up for the guys from UJ today? If you're from UJ, what's up? You know we're representing. Okay. And I've got a number of certifications. I'm a PRH, CEM, uh, PMP. 
and I've got over 10 years experience in the engineering field. I've worked for companies like Rainwater, John Thompson, Eskom, Sasol. I've done design work, maintenance work, projects, project management. And the last employment that I uh, that I had was in a leadership role where I was a divisional manager for a mechanical division for one of these consulting companies. So let's talk about Palucraft. Now, in order for you to understand who Palucraft is, let's talk about the history. And I'll be very fast with the this section because it's not the core of why we're here. So basically, Palucraft was founded in 2014. And when it was founded, it was founded as a company and it was not very clear what's going to happen. So it sort of evolved into what you call, I started writing an engineering blog. And in this engineering blog, I was talking about my experience in engineering. And from talking about my experience in engineering, that sort of um, like escalated, I got more traffic on the blog. And that blog turned into a website, which is what we know today as Palocraft GCC study. The focus moved from the general plant engineering um, experience that I had to helping people um, understand GCC factories and making GCC factories easy to pass and so forth, right? Now, that obviously now escalated and evolved to being a full-fledged business where we started selling study material, online courses, physical courses. We started um, working with other companies, um, various companies, um, private companies, and two SEO um, state-owned enterprises. And right now we're looking into the future where we are expanding into other professions like GCC Mines and Works and other certifications in construction and engineering. And we've launched the Engineering in Africa podcast where we're trying to actually like talk about engineering in a more broader African space. And we are moving uh, in a more broader skills development where like what we have today as a session is an example of moving into a more broader skills development um, training and resources. Now, our vision is very simple. We wanna contribute positively to the engineering industry. And we do this by providing reliable and accessible information that assists engineers, technologists, technicians, and artisans advance their careers. So if we help engineers, technologists, and technicians advance their careers, then they can contribute positively to the engineering industry. And when they contribute, positively to the engineering industry, they will be able to provide reliable and accessible information to junior guys and the cycle carries on and on and on. So today's session feeds into our, our much bigger vision statement and I am positive that you will enjoy it. Now, what do we do exactly? So. I'm gonna look at what we're doing today, which is a technical skills development session. Um, in, in terms of skills development, we help you decide, we help you learn, and we help you succeed. So in deciding is what we're gonna be talking about, like which career path should you be taking as an artisan, as a technician, or as an engineer. And we provide online courses, books. So with today's session, you will see that after today's session, in the coming days or weeks, there will be a formal online course where you can do the specific skills development and training that we that you need to close the gap. And we help you succeed by doing sessions like these ones, which some are free and some are paid sessions. So, but I can assure you 80% of our content is for free and with our free content, you will succeed. And if you want to get more in-depth stuff, then you can go to our paid content, which you can get from our, our website. So our website is polycraft-gccstudy.com. Um, you can chat to us. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see at the bottom right, there's a, chat there's a chat form. So just click that and you can send an instant message. And during office hours, we're able to answer within 30 minutes to an hour. And if you send on a Saturday, we normally answer um, back when we are back at the office. So guys, can I ask a huge favor? So if you are listening to this right now, please go to our 
our website, palocraft-gccstudy.com. Scroll all the way down and you'll see there it's written subscribe to our mailing list. So if you subscribe to our mailing list, you will get special offers on um, courses, online courses, books, and so forth that we'll be launching in the future. So I really appreciate it um, as a way to give back from what you're going to get today. Just subscribe to our email, uh, our mailing list and I'll really appreciate that. Cool. Now that's done, right? So this is our roadmap, guys. And let's go into step one, knowing that you don't know. So let's look if there's any questions from the guys. No questions so far. So I'm just going to go through step one. And then after this step one or session one, we'll take some questions and possibly have a five minute break just to stretch and reflect. So you don't know that you don't know. 70% of the time, you don't know that you don't know. There's an untapped knowledge that is sitting in your brain. There's untapped knowledge that uh, mentors, associates, and so forth can actually contribute to your life and to your career with. So if you don't know this, and it's a lot of information that you don't know, and the first step is to just admit that you are lost and to admit that, you know what, I don't know what to do with my career. And I think you joining this session today is actually the first step of that journey of actually admitting that I don't know and I need help. So now that you're saying, okay, I don't know and I need help, then now we look at the 10%, which is what you know. So you find sometimes that you know that you know, but you don't take action. And when you know certain things that you need to do to advance your career, then you don't take action, then you are basically taking a risk and you understand the risk. So for example, if you're sitting with your trade at N4 level and you know that you need to go and do your N6 level, your N5, then your N6, and you're not doing it. And every time you're not doing that, you are just putting your career at risk and you're just gonna remain stagnant. So it's good to know that you don't know and it's also good to know that you know, but action is more important. Other thing is, has to do with what you don't know. And what you don't know is the most dangerous one. So, and part of not knowing what you don't know helps you identify what you don't know. <laughs> so I know guys, it sort of, sort of feels like I'm going around and around with this knowing and don't knowing, but all of this is going to make sense when I start talking about the letter, of, the letter of inference. So for now, just know these three things. 70% of the time, you don't know that you don't know. 10% of the time, you, you know what you know, but you're not acting on it. And then sometimes you are acting on it. And then 20% of the time you just didn't know and it's not your fault. So that's why I started with saying it's not your fault. So you can see that 10% of where you are today is your fault. And 90% of it is, it's actually not your fault, but you've got control of that. So you don't know that you don't know You've got the, the, and then the other issue has to do with your vague, the vague goals. So right now, guys, you're talking about the mental barriers that are holding you back from succeeding. So you don't know what you don't know. There's the vague goals. So what, do I, what am I talking about by vague goals? So you remember, I said the issue that I have with some artisans is that they just look at the picture as a salary and a job title. I want to be a supervisor. Therefore, if I'm my supervisor, I'm going to earn X amount of salary. And it's okay to think like that. You know, it's part of not knowing that you don't know. Now that you know that there's actually a much bigger picture apart from salary and a job title, which is actually looking at other things like your ability to have free time, your mental health, your physical health, and liking what you do. So, so you find a situation where people will go, will choose a career that they don't even like. And once you choose a career that you don't like, then you spend a lot of time um, being confused, frustrated, and annoyed 
by this career and you're just angry every single day. Like there's people who are just angry every single day and it's just because they just chose the wrong careers. So if every time in your career you're getting queries and in the queries you are not, in, 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 in your queries you are not, um, what you call you're not you know you're not happy and you get annoyed and whatever maybe you just don't like that and when we're talking about the career paths maybe th that will um what you call that will um unpack the situation of what to actually focus on when it comes to your career so having vague goals means concentrating on salary and job title whereas having much more broader and more specific goals looks at a much broader picture that looks at everything that affects your career. Okay, sorry for the pause. Um, I think these, on the YouTube side, the, the slides are a bit blurry. Um, I think it will get better as the, the, the connection heats up, I guess. <laughs> All right, so you don't know what you don't know. You've got vague goals and you care too much what others think. Now, caring too much what other, others think brings us to this concept in psychology called the ladder of inference. Now, once you care too much what others think, then you get into a situation where it, it reinforces your limiting beliefs. Then when it reinforces your limiting beliefs, what you believe, influences your end behavior all right so you care what people think and say then that influences or reinforces your limiting beliefs and when that reinforces your limiting beliefs it affects your behavior and the choices that you make every day so let's make an example now you have a specific context of how you look at the world and what you believe, all right? So say, say for example, you believe you're sitting there right now, you're an artisan with your N4, um, possibly thinking of getting your GCC factories. Now, everybody is saying, or oh, you've heard somewhere that um, getting the GCC factories is impossible, impossible for artisans and um, what you call the exams, the GCC factories exams are very difficult. You're never gonna pass them. All right. So what that what that does is it feeds into your own context of life. So your new context is GCC factories is is, ex, is very hard, and I'm never gonna pass this thing. So that's your belief system. All right. Now this belief system that you have now feeds into the facts of life, facts about life that you have, and the fact now is the GCC factories is ridiculously difficult and I'm never going to pass it. So what happens? So you end up taking action. And in other words, you act on that belief that this thing is difficult. And when you believe that is difficult, what, what is the behavior? Your behavior is you don't even attempt it. You just sit with your N4 and you just work, you just work every day like a robot, go to work you know, weld and do your boiler making stuff, do your electrician stuff and just carry on with life. And it's all honky dory. Why? Because your internal belief system is such that you believe that this thing is hard and it is impossible for you. Therefore your behavior is, I'm not gonna even try. So what happens is more and more people like your colleagues, your friends that you sit with or you spend time with keep telling you the same thing. GCC factories is impossible, you're going to fail. And this external data now feeds even more into your own belief system and it feeds more into the facts that you know about life. So what happens? You find a situation where in your external, da in your external data, there's people like me and uh, Paulo Craft who say, hey, GCC factories is not difficult. GCC factories is possible, right? But because of your limiting beliefs, you choose to select the data that says this thing is difficult and you're going to fail and you must just don't act on it. Now, because you've chose the negative, then everything that you interpret about GCC factories is negative. And then you draw a conclusion to say this thing is 
is difficult and therefore you act on it and by not pursuing your GCC factories, by not pursuing your career development. Now, this, this whole picture here, guys, is called the ladder of inference. And it's all about, you. It's all, it, it deals with how your limiting beliefs keep reinforcing the situation or the position that you are, you are in your life right now. So if you are sitting there in your computer or watching on your phone and you've been an artisan uh, with an N4, and by artisan, guys, I mean whether he's a boiler maker or diesel mechanic, whatever, you've been that artisan with your N4 level qualification for the past five, eight years, you should be asking yourself, what are the things that have been preventing you from actually pursuing your career further by getting your N6, your national diploma, and advance your career and become a much better person in your workplace and so forth. And I can, if I sit down with you right now and you're in that situation where you've been stuck in the same position or stuck in the same field for a very long time and you are miserable, then I know for a fact that there's a lot of limiting beliefs and negative uh, beliefs that you have that are influencing your behavior. Right, guys, so that's the psychology. <laughs> so sorry for the psychology lecture, but it will help give a good context of what we're gonna talk about in upcoming slides. So it's very important that you start changing your belief system. So today is that day. So today you're gonna change your belief system and you're gonna, you're gonna stop caring what other people say. If what other people say is negative, Let's, let's select that data and chuck it away and say, listen, we're going to focus on the positive. So everything is, pos is possible. So if you're sitting there and you feel like, you know what, me get, being a supervisor one day is impossible. No, it's possible. They, you're sitting there, you're thinking, ah, at work, there's too many politics. It's impossible for me to actually climb the ladder. No, it's not impossible. It's possible. We can, you can do it if you just change the way you're thinking and the change the way you're approaching things. And that's what we're going to also cover today, how you should approach these situations and how you should approach your career development, skills development, getting qualifications, certifications, and so forth. Because at the end of the day, if you keep believing what you believe and you keep reinforcing it with external negative data and internal negative data, you will keep going, like you'll, you'll keep being very destitute with your career, being stuck, being in one place for too long. And if you're in one place for too long, you, you, you grow to be frustrated and you get annoyed with people and your work and so forth. So, that's about caring too much what others think. The other thing that is a mental barrier to a lot of, lot of artisans is that you, you're trying to figure out everything without a role model or a mentor. You're not getting help. So you want, and if you are getting help, you're getting help from the wrong people. So Whoever is showing you the, di the direction that you need to take, are they really showing you the right direction? Are they really showing you the right path that you need to be, you, you need to be focusing on? So this is where choosing the right mentors, choosing the right, um, what you call the right um, colleagues or people that you chill with, choosing the right role models becomes very important. Like for me, I've seen that in the engineering space, there's not a lot of um, role models that you know artisans or even engineers can look at and say you know what one day I want to be just like this guy and I want to know what this guy did and then I'm, I want to model that instead you get a situation where if you do identify someone who looks like a role model and you start trying to find out so how did he do it and a lot of the people what they do is they do they kick the ladder so once they've climbed and they've gotten to a, a position or a place where you feel like, you know what, I want to be there one day and you try to ask for help, they just kick the ladder. So today you're going to take charge of your career and you're not going to care about the people who kick the ladder because I want to mentor you on how to take control of your career and take control of your life. 
a mental barrier that a lot of artisans also have is not playing the long game. So remember this slide over here. So you just looking at salary and job title. Now, it's not just about salary and job title. So you need to play a much longer game and you'll see what I'm talking about in upcoming slides when I say playing a much longer game. Big, big problem, again, with a lot of artisans that I've worked with um, is that they stop learning. They, they don't have a culture of lifelong learning where they always advancing their careers and advancing the knowledge that they have. And again, feeds back to not knowing what you don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, if you're not um, learning and you're not um, you know, advancing, getting qualifications and getting certifications and so forth, then you're not closing that gap of, of knowing what you don't know. So what are the common skills deficiencies that are limiting your progress as an artisan today? The big, big one is leadership skills. So the thing that's limiting your progress from moving from artisan to, um, to supervisor to management is cause you don't have those little, you, maybe you do have, but or you have very little of the leadership skills that can take you to the next level. What am I talking about? Managing others. So if you can't manage others, then thinking about the supervisor position or management management position is going to be very difficult. And even the 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 methodologies and the the stuff that I'm going to teach you later on today is going to be difficult because you don't know how to. If you don't know how to manage others or you don't even have a passion for managing others and you get annoyed and you've got the kick the ladder mentality, then it's going to be a very difficult journey for you. So the one of the things that you need to learn is how to manage others and managing others. It's a very broad topic, which, you know, we don't have a lot of time today to look at ev everything that has to do with what does it mean managing others. So we'll do an online course for that and we'll you'll be able to understand in detail what that means. You don't know how to manage a business. So remember, when you're a supervisor, you are managing resources. So you're managing people, um, which is a human, which is a resource. You're managing um, tools, spares. You're managing time uh, of these people, the time of the company. You're managing production. So if all of those things have to do, if, if you don't have the right management skills, then you will find it very difficult to manage all those things. And what 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 else do I mean by management skills? If you don't you you don't know how to 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 schedule tasks, you don't know how to uh, do a budget to plan the finances, then it will be very difficult for you to climb that ladder. If you don't know how to manage the finances, right? So you find that a lot of artisans, um, one of the big things that that's a barrier is you you don't know how to to what to call to manage the monies or maybe maybe you do know how to manage it, but you haven't gotten that experience at the level that is required at whatever company to manage those finances. So if you don't have a track record of how to manage finances from a business point of view, then it becomes a bit difficult. Communication is the biggest. And you'll see in the last session, we talk up, I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, writing an effective CV. So that's part of communication. Um, presenting yourself well during an interview, that's part of communication. So a lot of artisans, um, they don't have that good communication. Even small things like writing a report. If I say, okay, you've done this task, can you submit a report? to say, what did you do exactly? And the quality of the reports, you can tell that it, they're not, um, what you call, at the standard of the compet your competition. Remember, if you're sitting there as an artisan and you wanna be a supervisor and you wanna be, um, what you call, you wanna be a manager, remember that you are, you are competing with guys who've got bachelors in engineering. You're competing with guys with national diplomas. Now, guys with your national diploma BTEC degree, they they have a lot of um, like skill skills or knowledge and experience on writing 
reports that you know management would like to see so you come in as an artisan yes in your program you do some um, english or whatever but it's not at the level that your competition is at for example in an engineering degree you probably do like over 20 um, technical reports in the four years that you study right and then when you compare to your artisan um, learning um, your learning uh, lifespan you find that you don't do a lot of technical report writing so what that means is when you get to a level remember now it's supervisor and management level you need to now start reporting so now the way you don't have a track record to demonstrate that you can report properly and in general you're not reporting the way you're supposed to report so communication skills are very critical again we'll we'll talk about communication skills it's a it's a it's a whole session on its own to talk about communication skills and what exactly you can do to improve those communication skills so make sure that you go to our website palocraft-gccstudy.com scroll all the way down subscribe to our mailing list we will be sharing some information um, on how to improve your communication skills conflict management so conflict management you can also think of um, being uh, what the concept of emotional intelligence so again if i compare remember your competition b tech guys engineering guys the engineering guys they do uh, a communication course like a whole full communication course that even talks about the, the con concepts of conflict management uh concepts of emotional um, emotional intelligence unfortunately if you look at the artisan uh, knowledge or training that you do it doesn't focus a lot on this conflict management and emotional intelligence so if you've got a, an exam pad or a paper that you're writing at uh writing on right now just make a huge nb and write conflict management emotional intelligence again subscribe to our mailing list we'll be sharing more information on that there's emotional intelligence and then there's the technical skills so the great thing is with being an artisan is you understand how to do the actual work which is fantastic which is great but the big limiting thing is you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing so sometimes you do to say well um i'm welding this um uh, what to call five millimeter thick weld um, because with this heat input because um, of if I do it at a higher input, it will cause slugging or whatever. So it's great, you know that, but you still don't have that background knowledge of like the nitty gritties in terms of the material composition, the material science behind it, the, um, the, 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 the standards that govern all of that. So you just know how to do the work. Again, it's not entirely your fault. It's just that the program that you go through does that. So how do you set yourself apart as an artisan, say you're a boiler maker, say you're a welder or whatever in your field, how do you set yourself apart? Learn the sand standards. So every, every job that you're doing is governed by some sort of standard. It can be a sand standard, it can be an international standard, it can be um, best engineering practice when it comes to equipment sizing and so forth. So if you can learn those things for, for whatever task that you're doing if you can go deeper and ask the engineer in charge ask your supervisor your manager whoever and ask them okay why am i doing this whatever i'm doing the way i'm doing it and that will feed into your technical skills um even when it comes to system optimization like you understand for example if you're doing um, normal maintenance and operation you understand that okay, if I close this valve, it will cause the pump to cavitate, which is great. But when there's specific um, issues on, on trying to optimize the system, then you find that, the, again, it's not your fault. It's just that the, the background knowledge and um, education that you get does not focus on like a systems approach. It just focuses on that specific thing that you are going to be a trade-off. So you're going to need to... Um, you know, push yourself and stretch yourself in trying to understand 
like much broader systems. And the thing about system optimization, again, from what I've seen with the, the guys who are pursuing, for example, GCC factories, you, you pick it up there to see, especially when we're talking about boilers and um, how to improve boiler efficiency. The artisan students that we have usually take a bit longer to 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 grasp the concepts, the systems concepts, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just that the background knowledge that you you got from your qualification and training just didn't expose you to that systems optimization. Now, it's a great thing that you're joining today's session because now you know that you don't know and that there's a more, thinking of a systems approach is actually gonna benefit your career a lot. So the next one has to do with safety skills. So a lot of artisans, they understand that, yeah, when I'm doing my task, um, I need to do a risk assessment and then I need to identify my hazards and do a risk assessment and um, get a permit to work, blah, 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 right? So you understand that, but do you know why you're doing it? You know, So when it comes to interviews, especially now, we're talking GMR2, like these high management positions or even senior supervisor positions. When it comes to safety um, skills. It's not enough to just know what task you need to complete um, in order to ensure safety compliance, but you also need to understand the background on why are you doing some of the safety tasks that you're doing. So having an in-depth understanding of the hire process, where does it come from? Why are you doing it? How does it relate to the Occupational Health and Safety Act? And for the guys who are in the mining, how does doing HIRA. So remember HIRA is hazard identification and risk assessment. So how does HIRA relate for the guys in mining? How does HIRA relate to um, the, the, the broader concept of uh, the broader mine and health and safety, mine health and safety act and the mineral act regulations, right? So if you, if you can't connect those activities to the regulations, to the acts, uh, to safety best, best practices, then you are going to expose yourself or we're going to see it in your CV and we're going to see it in the interview when we start asking specific questions and more background to try to understand if you really understand where this thing comes from and how it affects the broader, broader scheme of things. So OHS Act, regulations, the OH, OHS management systems, so right now you're sitting there, um, if you're a graduate, you just recently graduated as an artisan. So when you go work, what happens is they just throw you in, they say, just do as we, we do, you understand? And you, you never get an opportunity to understand like the broader scheme of things to say, why do we have an OHS management system? How does this OHS management system um, improve the safety in the, in the factory or the mine? And how does it improve how I do my work? And what's the importance of it? So at supervisor management level, it's not, it's not just about um, the tasks. Right? So you need to now move away from that mentality of I'm doing a pre-job a pre-job uh, pre um, risk assessment and because I just they, they said I must do it I must just comply I understand so that is a, an important um, aspect when it comes to skills so you are not progressing from artisan to supervisor to management because of the skills deficiencies and the key skills deficiencies are summarized on this slide. If you look at the safety skills deficiencies, um, if you go to our um, the GCC Factories OHS Act book and our OHS Act um, course, we actually provide the detailed background on these reg on the regulations on why you on on why are you doing certain tasks in your factory so it might be important for you to consider that as well now let's look at some of the common barriers 
why you are not making why you are not making it past the CV review stage. Why are you not making it past the interview stage? So some of them I've already um, touched on, and some of them I will be repeating here, and there will be uh, one or two which are new. Now, your CV. If I look at your CV, um, it's very generic, and you're not saying you're not uh, presenting the meaningful work accomplishments. Now, just write write that down and it will make sense in uh, session four. So when we get to step four and step three, all of this will start making sense. You don't present meaningful and critical skills in your CV. And then if somehow you make it past the CV stage and you're in, in the interview, when we, when we start asking you, more specific questions, then it, be, it starts being a challenge because you you don't have that more broader understanding. So you just understand the task, task, task. Again, guys, this is not a session to criticize you, but it's a session to say, listen, you don't know that you don't know, and this is these are the things that you don't know, and these are the things that you need to start working on addressing. All right. So you'll see when we get to the professional development plan and we're going to have a specific plan on how to address some of these key things. Now, skills, you've got little evidence of continued learning and professional development. Now, if you don't have continued learning, it means that you're not feeding into your skills. If you're not feeding into your skills, you're not feeding into your experience and you and if you're not feeding into your experience, you're not accomplishing much at work. So if every day you're waking up and you're doing the same thing over and over, it's great. Uh, but now there needs to come to a point where you're stretching yourself to do much difficult things and don't just be caught up into in the the whole vibe of i wake up i go to work and i work you understand so you need to get to a point where you start stretching yourself and how do you stretch yourself those skills that we were talking about so if you are at work and there's not a lot of work there's not a lot of activities that you're busy with then you should be spending time with managers engineers and so forth to ask those questions like what is this ohs management system um, where does it come from like start asking much more deeper questions and those deeper questions will will open opportunities and those opportunities um, could lead to being identified to do further courses further certification qualifications and so forth and again i'm repeating myself you know the soft skills guys not having or improving those soft skills as a technical as a as an artisan is holding you back because when it when i look at a lot of artisan cvs um and i'm talking about artisan cvs of people who want to who are applying to be a supervisor or a manager you find that a lot of the qualifications or certifications or training that you're doing has to do with your specific trade so you'll go do um, specifically on um, different weld, uh, the different ways of welding. So I'm talking to the boiler makers and welders out there. So you will focus a lot on doing a lot of training on welding, welding, welding. Nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that when you're trying to move higher up the ladder, then you need to start also including some softer skills like report writing, like um, presentation. Um, how to use an Excel, you know, uh, uh, using Excel to present data, interpret data, you know, so doing, developing um, uh, procedures, writing procedures. Um, so, so all of those softer skills, managing people, like how do you manage people? How do you, um, how do you lead people? How do you manage conflict? So all those softer skills, you also need to think about and do those training qualifications and so forth that talk to the more the much softer skills and you're using a very generic cv and like a lot of guys will use one cv and apply for all types of jobs so you a supervisor position in a maintenance and operation environment is very different from a supervisor position in a construction sort of environment so you find yourself 
um, saying, well, uh, there's, a, there's a position in the maintenance and operation space, and you use the same CV as you use for construction, and you find that it's too generic even for the, the two um, industries. So we'll talk about how to improve your CV to make it less generic. You're not applying for roles that are aligned with your skills and experience. Now, I'm not gonna talk too much on this point right now because I wanna save this for later. There is a very interesting relationship between skills and experience, qualifications and certifications. And let me not talk too much about this right now. You'll see when I talk about it later, you see how that relationship feeds into Number one, writing a better CV. Number two, pre presenting um, what you call yourself better during an interview. So on the side, just write the relationship, the relationship between skills and experience. And when I talk about that relationship later, I will share insights on how you can gain skills um, without necessarily having to gain experience on those skills and how to gain experience to to what to call to improve your skills and get other certifications and qualifications and so forth. So we'll talk about that later. So for now, just take that point and make 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 an asterisk over there. So at this point, um, I wanna take some questions. All right, so we'll take a five minute break guys. And then after five minutes, um, we'll come back and then cover session two. And then from session two, we'll then um, take another break, cover session three, break session four, and then we'll be done for today. So I hope you're enjoying the session so far. And yeah, so if you've got any questions, put it on the comments and you can also put questions, you can also um, call our phone Got the phone right here and we'll put you on loudspeaker and then so that everybody hears your question and then we'll take it from there all right
All right. All right, guys, um, so far, how are you finding the session? Can I get some comments? How's the session so far? Are you getting some benefits so far? Let's get some comments going. Are you benefiting so far? Um, is there something that, you know, has stuck? Uh, what you call is, um, you know, stuck. I, I saw the comment on the the kicking the ladder <laughs> so yeah so we get we get a lot of the, we get a lot of those all right so any comments guys you can share um what you your experience so far with what we've covered all right thanks collins all right so let's carry on guys um if you've got if you've got anyone um, like your friends, colleagues, who you think can benefit from today's session, please you can um, if you're on Facebook, um, tag them on the comments. Um, if you're on um, YouTube, tag them on the comments. Um, if you've got friends on your WhatsApp, share the link. Let's you know try to get more and more people involved today, and let's not kick the ladder. You know, so let's not be those people who are kicking the ladder. Right, cool. Now let's carry on with the session and I will cover some of the questions that um, are popping in much later. So here's our roadmap, right? So in terms of our roadmap, we are done um, with uh, step one. So right now you should be in a position to number one, understand the mental barriers that are limiting your progress. Number two, you will you should understand that there's a lot of negative um, like information and attitudes that you will get externally that you need to be in a position to discard. But also there's a lot of negative information and um, attitudes that you are having internally as an artisan that are limiting your your progress and so forth. And at this point, you should be in a position to say, listen, uh, there's actually some skills that I don't have. And the skills that I don't have are contributing to this, this whole notion of, I don't know that I don't know. So the other thing is you should now at this point understand and know why you're not getting the jobs that you are getting you know and it all boils down to not knowing what you don't know it boils down to limiting beliefs is boils down to the environment that you're exposing yourself to and not having a lot of um, role models not having mentors career coaches having a lot of negativity from either friends colleagues or just the general environment that you're exposing yourself to so that's what we've covered under step one Step two, you need to get help. So that's why you're here today. And from getting this help, then we are going to identify the knowledge gaps. And we've already identified the skills gaps. So let's look at the knowledge gaps that we you need to, to close in order for you to actually strive. So I want to emphasize something. Remember that when you, as an artisan, you are now competing for supervisor position and you're competing for GMR 2.1 position um, in, from the factory's point of view and from the mining point of view, you're competing for 2131 positions. You remember that you are now competing with guys with bachelors in mechanical, electrical engineering and chemical engineering. So you're competing with guys who, who have received extensive training and um, they've, ex they've received um, extensive knowledge from their degrees. You're competing with guys with BTEC degrees. You're competing with guys with national diplomas. So if you're still sitting at N6 level, you've got your GCC factories or you've got your GCC mines and works and you're not getting that 213 one position, you need to remember that. Who are you competing with? And you also need to remember the skills gap that is that is holding you back. 
you need to remember the limiting beliefs that are holding you back. So you are an artisan sitting there with your trade test. So a lot of trade tests are either NQF level um, three or NQF level four. And um, you see that you've got an N3 or N4. Um, that's what your trade test gives you. All right. So you've got different options that you can choose. All right. So now in this session, we are talking about the different options and we're talking about the possibilities. So you will see that, and, and I think this slide will be fantastic for guys who just got their trade test. So if you've got your trade test um, the past you know, three years or less, then this is going to be the most beneficial. For the guys who are sitting here and you, you're sitting at N4 level um, and uh, what you call 10 years, 15 years experience, it will be an eye-opener and it will be um, a slide which will most probably um, get you thinking and reflecting about the choices that you've made in your career uh, or the lack of choices that you've make, made in your career. So route number one. So work your entire life as, a tr uh, as uh, in your trade and maybe you'll become a supervisor one day and you will retire. So that's the first option that you have. You get your N4 and you just chill with your N4 get experience, job hop, work for that employer, or work for the same employer. And guys, I'm not criticizing this choice of a route as being good or bad. I'm just saying this is an option, right? It is a route and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's, there's a lot of guys who um, are fitters and tenors for years, for like 35 years, 40 years, and they're very happy very happy and there's nothing wrong with that so today's session is not covering those sort of uh, people who are very happy with their trade and they don't really mind you know sitting with their n4 indefinitely until they retire and just working with their what to call their trade nothing wrong at all right i'm just saying this is the first this is one option or one route that you can choose for your career then there's the technical route in the in the in the maintenance and operation space. Now, the technical route in the operation and maintenance space is very interesting, and it's the one that I think has a lot of um, has a lot of prospects. If you are your ambitions are one day you want to be an engineering manager, or even one day you want to be an executive in you know whether a senior manager within like companies like Sasol or Escom or whatever or one day you want to be an executive in those big corporates or even much smaller companies so the technical route on maintenance operation has a lot of um, potential to take you there but again the choice is yours so let's look at the technical route so the first thing that you can do in your technical route is to obtain your N6 level. So when you obtain your N6 level, it opens up different um, it opens up different opportunities. So with an N6, you can still be an artisan, and, but at this at this point, you might be an artisan who gets paid slightly more um, compared to an artisan who just has an N4 in a trade, right? So you could um, be e much easily get those supervisor, not easily, but the chances of getting those supervisor role with your N6, um, uh, the chances start being much better. So that's route number two. Get your N6, be an artisan, uh, work in maintenance operation, become an uh, supervisor one day and retire. And again, nothing wrong with that. A lot of people are happy with, with that route. Then there's route number three, where are over and above your N6, you get your national diploma and you get your BTEC. So remember what I said in the previous slide, who is your competition? So now you, in route three, you're basically saying, okay, let me upskill myself to be at a level that my competition is at. Because if I'm now at a level where my competition is at, then I stand a much better chance to compete, right? So again, this is a choice. 
right so at at um your route three you will be an artisan probably get a promotion be a supervisor and then as as in parallel so whilst you are climbing the ladder from artisan to supervisor you are busy with your national diploma you're busy with your after your national diploma and then you have, you will you will do your btec and if you're going to stick around maintenance and operation you definitely need to get your gcc factories if you are working in a factory environment and you will need you to get your gcc mines if you are working in a mining environment so what will that do so that will make that will create a situation where you move from artisan to supervisor to plant engineer right so from a finance point of view you you will start seeing a lot of salary jumps but remember we're not just looking at salary and position but we're looking at being a more fulfilled and more round person or like more complete person so with being a plant engineer you know then with being a plant engineer then you you are much closer to actually fulfilling your 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 ambitions of one day being a manager so remember at plant engineer level yeah so you, you know you can think of it as uh, you know like a junior manager sort of because sometimes it's like full fledged um what to call manager especially in the mining side if you're a section engineer then you literally full fledged and you've got a lot of people reporting to you and yeah you're managing a cost center and there's a lot of things that you're doing right now what's important to note with route 3 is that you can technically be a plant engineer without getting your national diploma and your btech and by just getting your gcc and you can be a plant engineer now why that will be a bit tricky is it goes back to how i started this presentation to say the biggest thing that's holding um guys who are just who just have an n6 and a gcc is that they've got a huge skills gap that their competition which is the national diploma guys the btech guys the engineer guys ha already have so my advice with root three is that maybe considering doing your national diploma btech and and your gcc so remember your national diploma btech and gcc can happen in parallel so you don't have to wait to do your your btech before you can start your journey with gcc all right so yeah so that would be my advice so do your national diploma and gcc in parallel eventually get your btech and you are able to compete much better with the plant with the plant engineers who are already at that level now the next step from plant engineer is engineering manager right so it goes back to what um how we started the conversation you can technically be an engineering manager they actually there are engineering managers who only have an n6 and a gcc there are there very few of them right so you can theoretically get to that that point as well but it will be very hard because unless you all those skill deficiencies that we were talking about all the all that knowledge gap that we've already touched on if you can close that gap then you can get away with having your n6 gcc and one day move from plant engineer to engineering manager right but again remember you are competing with national diploma guys btech guys engineering guys and sometimes you're even competing at engineering manager level you're even competing with guys with master's degrees and in rare occasions with doctorates so it makes it makes the competition even much harder so that's where you need to now push yourself and get more skills now there is also the possibility of moving from engineering manager to one day being an engineering executive right so it's very very rare um the I've, i i haven't seen a lot of engineering executives who just have n6 
and their GCC and make it to executive level without doing other short courses and other interventions along the way. And other interventions and short courses could or may include doing your diploma, BTEC, doing advanced diplomas, um, attending executive programs and so forth. So they to get to that level will require you to close a lot of skill, uh, skills gaps and knowledge gaps, right? So that's the, that, this root three looks amazing. Does it, doesn't it look so amazing? So if you're sitting there, you're a graduate, you're, you just got your N4, I've just painted how your career can really blossom, but you need to deal with your limiting beliefs. You need to deal with the fact that you don't know what you don't know. You need to get help, you need to get a mentor, if possible, get a career coach and upskill yourself. Right, so another option, again, somewhere within the maintenance and operation is once you've got your national diploma um, and your BTEC, and possibly your GCC, you can decide, you know what, this maintenance thing is not for me. I just wanna move into the design side and you know, just do drawings and do calculations, give to these guys and they must go implement. So that's where now being a design engineer starts being a possibility. Now with the design engineer, you will most definitely have to get your national diploma, BTEC, and getting your GCC, maybe not really necessary, but could um, you know score you some brownie points. And at design engineer, then you're gonna start looking at um, getting your professional registration with EXA and so forth. Now with design engineer, again, there's a possibility where your career can move into engineering manager and engineering executive. So that's the exciting part of the technical route. And under the technical route, as you can see, there's route two and route three. Now let's look at construction route. So under the construction route, pretty straightforward. Again, you can move from artisan to supervisor, get your PMP or PR, uh, PRCPM, get your project management or construction manager role, and maybe be a construction executive one day. Now in the construction route, it, Again, they, they are a situation where you, you get a guy who just has an N6 level and climbs, uh, climbs the ladder within the, their, their, their company and one day become a project manager or construction manager and one day becoming a senior manager and being uh, one of the executives in that organization. So it's also possible, right? So. If you're gonna go construction route, then things like GCC factories start being pointless. So it's something that I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't advise to say, okay, do your GCC factories if you're gonna choose the construction route because you're not really gonna use a lot of the GCC factories. But what becomes important in the construction route is um, your, uh, what you call um, the construction um, the construction act. So construction regulation, sorry, the construction regulation and under the construction regulation, the important thing is having your PRCPM in South Africa at least, and especially when you're working um, with uh, public, com uh, public companies and government and so forth, and uh, PMP where you're doing um, more private jobs and which are not too construction heavy, but there's that um, construction element where you need to project manage and so forth. Cool, so that's another route that you can consider. Then there's route number five, which is entrepreneurship. Now under route number five, again, there is just a matter of gaining ex, uh, experience or expertise, expertise in your trade and expertise in that specific industry. So for example, if um, you're a boiler maker and then you start a company that a company that will um, do welding and uh, fabrication, you don't you as the business owner don't necessarily have to go and um, worry too much about all these qualifications and so forth. Important thing for you is understanding your industry, um, understanding the work that you're doing, uh, finding clients, and then hiring um, other artisans and engineers and, and other employees to make sure that it's a functioning business. And then you will strive as a business owner, right? So, so those are the different routes that you have. 
Now, you get situations where there's people who are choosing Route 5, which is entrepreneurship, and they, I won't say waste time, but they want to get their, their, what you call their GCC, their PR, and da da da. On the entrepreneurship leg, it's you as the business owner, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna be doing the work, okay, fine, you need to do all of those certifications and qualifications and so forth. But then you are, no, it's no longer an entrepreneurship journey, it's just you being self employed. So, which is basically a worker, but I'm talking about pure entrepreneurship where you've identified a business gap and from that business gap, you are trying to solve or uh, address that gap um, through making resources available, marketing, um, networking, getting clients and executing the work. So that's the entrepreneurship part. So guys, here's the big picture. So now at this point, you need to make a decision. Right, so you need to make a decision and choose the route that you want. And guys, if you're looking at this, then I've sort of given you a career goal. Okay, I've given you a career goal. I've like plotted this career goal for you. And from this career goal, we can then start talking about a professional development plan or the plan to achieve this career goal. All right, so the first step starts with choosing. If you choose to say, listen, I just wanna work as an artisan, I'm happy where I am, I'm happy with you know my info and you know I love the overtime, I don't have stress of managing people and so forth and so forth. I don't really care about being a supervisor, I don't care about being a manager. And then you can end your session right now. <laughs> and then it's the end of the, the day for you and there's nothing more I can help you with moving forward. So it's the perfect time to um, click the, the, what you call, um, I leave the, the live stream and go do whatever you want to do right now. But if you are saying, okay, I wanna move, you know, past the, my N4, my N6, and I actually wanna be a supervisor one day. And I actually wanna be a plant engineer one day. I wanna be an engineering manager one day and then Stick around, let's carry on. If you wanna, if it's construction route you're taking, I wanna, you know, again, artisan supervisor, project manager, or construction manager, or being a construction executive one day, stick around and let's talk about it. Um, if you wanna be an entrepreneur one day, um, you might, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about moving forward might help, might not help. So yeah, you can stick around and, and see, you know. So it might help you if you're choosing the entrepreneurial route. Right, so why do why many artisans never make it to supervisor management, GMR 2.1, 213? Is because you lack the skills, right? And these are the skills that we've already touched on, um, what you call much earlier, and I've described the skills in much details. Now, in the upcoming session, I'm gonna talk about how do you get these skills um, how do you, because now we've got a career goal, right? So we've got a career goal. So now let's do a career plan. So how do I, how do I write my, how do I develop this career plan that will take me to this goal that I'm looking for, right? So at this point, that's the end of session two. Um, I'm going to take some questions. Um, I see there's some comments that have been made. Let's see what's going on.
Right, so we are going into the more exciting part now. So we've done with step two. And under step two, what the outcome of step two was to, number one, understand the different career paths. Number two, and, and, and making a decision on which career path actually speaks to you and a career path that actually will work for you. Right. So if you've chosen your career path, now let's look at how you can define the, the developmental gaps. And then in session four, we'll talk about how to address some of these developmental gaps. All right. So let's see these guys who have went for coffee and not come, not came back. All right, guys, come back from your coffee, but we'll carry on with the guys who are there. Now, how do you decide which career path you should follow? So it's easy. Um, if there is the roadmap. You know, there's obviously from this summarized career, um, career path or career plan, there is different, you know, permutations and you can, you know, take different routes or whatever. But the important thing right now is choosing which career path. At this point, right, I want to, again, emphasize the issue of this limiting beliefs. So you will get struggles like uh, Benjamin, we, we had on the call right now, you are going to have challenges, you are going to have problems. And the important thing is to have a system like a supportive system that, you know, whether it's uh, friends or family, colleagues, um, who will keep pushing. Um, you've got Palocraft, <laughs> you've got me who's going to keep pushing you to say, listen, just keep pushing. Like there's, there's always going to be like a curveball, just keep pushing. So challenge your limiting beliefs, um, work on yourself, work on your own internal limiting beliefs. Now, how do you design this professional development plan that will help you achieve your specific career path? So Number one, we all know that we're sitting at this point here where we've got our N4 and our trade test, but we want to get to this point where, you know, um, where we want to be either artisans for life or we want to be engineers or we want to be engineering managers, executive and entrepreneur, whatever that end goal is, you just need to choose your journey. All right, so right now, just choose your path. And then once you've chosen your path, then we, we, you will see that, okay, I'm sitting at N4 trade test and I want to be, let's start, let's start small. I want to go to supervisor level. What is the gap and how do I fill this gap? Now, let's make an example. So now I'm going to give you practical ways on how to, number one, develop a professional development develop a professional development plan and how to write a better CV that is aligned with this professional development plan and what employers are looking for and how when you're in an interview, you need to be talking. So this is my the blueprint that I've uh, developed, which simplifies everything. And if you just follow this blueprint, then you will see how it makes your life easy. So let's make an example that, okay, so you're at N4 level. So remember our, our whole journey, we're at N4 level, we've got our trade test and we wanna get to a point where we can secure a supervisor position. So guys, why do employers employ you as a person? So you need to, if you understand why employers employ specific people at specific roles, then you will then have half your problem solved. Now, let me share a secret with you. Here's the secret. Employers hire you because you've got a specific skill that you're looking, that, that they're looking for. And with that specific skill, you, you will um, contribute towards their overall goal as, a, as, an, as an organization, whether it's, um, producing oil, producing um, cold drink, beer, whatever. So you and your skill will contribute towards their bigger 
picture. So what do I mean? So let's look at artisans. The thing with artisans is if let's get again, I'm gonna make a simple example as a boiler maker. So if you're a boiler maker and you go through your trade and you've got your experience and whatever, and I'm sitting here as an employer and you're applying for a position as a boiler maker, the skill that I will be looking at from you is to say, okay, boiler making involves um, fabricating the, the steel and joining it together using welding, blah, blah, blah. I practically. Um, okay, so I see there's one of the streams that is going, okay, it's back. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I just got a notification that one of the streams was um, struggling with a connection, but it, the connection is fixed. Sorry about that. All right, so your employer, an employer, I'm sitting here as an employer, you're a boiler maker, and I need a, boy, a, a person, a physical person who will come and you know, bend this metal and join it together and have a final product that I can sell to my, pro uh, that I can sell to my um, customers. Now, here's the secret, guys. What is a skill? A skill is a combination of experience, training, qualification, and certification, all right? So for you to be able to have a skill in, any, in anything in life, you need to have one of these four things. So the skill that you have, so for example, if you, if you know how to weld, you learned how to weld from either experience where you just um, saw a welding machine and you, you, you took the welding rod and they said switch it on here and then you started welding and from that experience, now you know how to do welding, right? You can gain experience for welding by going to, for training, like going to a, you know, doing a trade test and being trained how to do the welding, okay? You can go do a qualification. So if you look at um, what you call going and doing your N3 and four, um, and then during your N3 and four, they will, you know, do the training. And from that training, you get a qualification that says, yep, you are able to do the welding and we've given you all the knowledge, information that you need in order to be a good welder. So that's where the qualification comes in. So qualification now becomes a combination of the knowledge and the training part of things. Then you go on, you go on and do your trade test, which is now a certification. So with your trade test, basically it's they, they're saying, well, Based on your on your qualification and the training that you've um, you've obtained, and we've tested you independently at this training center, we can certify that you are actually a boiler maker or a good boiler maker, and then you get certification. So here's the interesting part. In order for you to be good at what you're doing you like in terms of your training your qualifications and your certification in order for you to be good at those three things you need to reinforce it with experience now you combine all four things you've got a skill i don't know if it makes sense right so what does this have to do with moving from um, artisan to supervisor right so let's look at a supervisor position and let's look at what sort of skills do you need at supervisor level. Now I'm gonna make an example with one skill, which is managing people, all right, or managing others. Now, how do you get an ex how do you get experience? Oh, sorry, how do you get the skill of managing others? You get the skill of managing others by managing others through experience. So, how do you do that? Well, if you are give, if there's a project and in that project they say, okay, there's some junior guys, make sure the, uh, what you call these are your your assistants and these assistants uh, you need to manage them in terms of how uh, the amount of time that they're gonna um, spend in helping you with certain activities, what activities they need to spend uh, help you with the you managing their leave so they can't just go. You need to. So that whole experience from just having two assistants 
can be an experience that feeds into the skill of managing others, okay? So that's one way of gaining a skill to manage others. What's another way? Another way we can do training. So what is training? Training is online courses, right? So a session like this today, you it's it's some it's a form of training, all right? So you can go and do an online course about how to manage others, okay? Now, when you do the online course, you'll be trained on that and you can now take what you've learned from that online course or that training and go and say, okay, you two people that are managing, I'm going to manage you according to the training that I've received, okay? So what other way can you gain the skill of managing others? You can gain a skill of managing others by getting a qualification, right? So qualification would be maybe you go do a unit standard in management or you go do a short course um, in, in uh, managing others, right? Then you're going to have a qualification that says you have been imparted with the knowledge and we've tested you that you have the knowledge to manage others. So what's the difference between training and qualification? Training, you in, in most cases or in all cases, does not have an element where they are evaluating or certifying Sorry, they are evaluating that indeed we are able to apply this skill. So, for example, if you go to a, a, short, a short course or a training course for, um, for managing others and at the end of the course you just get a, a, an attendance certificate and you never write a test or submit any assignment, then that's just normal training, right? So they, there's no evaluation that happens. Then you get to... A point where you get qualification. Now, in qualification, they will impart the knowledge, and then after they've imparted the knowledge, you need to submit um, either a report or sub uh, or write a specific test that evaluates that you indeed understood the knowledge that was imparted to you. So that's qualification. Now, what's certification? So certification is very similar to qualification. The difference, my, uh, what you call the difference with certification versus qualification is that with qualification, you find that the unit standard or the course or the qualification is registered with the South African Qualifications Authority and it has a specific, um, what you call NQF level and specific credits registered are, are under it. With certification, yes, sometimes you do get, like for example, the trade certificates, they've got a linked um, a linked um, NQF level and so forth, but you get other certifications such as your GCC factories, your PR Eng, your PMP, your PRCPM, which don't have specific credits with SACA, and they don't have specific unit standards with SACA and so forth. So therefore they sit as a certification. So with certification, same story. If you are managing others, right? So let's look at something like PMP. So um, part of PMP in the module of uh, your PMP. So remember PMP is the professional manage, uh, sorry, project management professional. With a project management professional, there's an element of managing others. and in the exam for the certification as a PMP, there's a, what you call a section where they are evaluating your knowledge on uh, what you call managing others. And the other thing about certification, it also to a certain extent um, looks at your experience related to that certification. So for instance, um, GCC will have questions that uh, that talk to your experience. And actually with GCC, for you to gain entrance, they look at your experience. So part of that certification process looks at experience. So there is the formula. If you want to demonstrate a specific skill that you have, or you want to communicate a specific skill that you have to an employer, you need to demonstrate or communicate it in, in the form of a combination of experience, training, qualifications, and certification, right? So I'm going to make um, another example on this when we talk about the CV, okay? So for now, you need to have this, write it down somewhere, um, or take a screenshot, whatever, 
but look at this over here. So our goal is to become a supervisor. One of the skills of being a supervisor that is required is to manage others. How am I going to demonstrate that I have this skill? Either from experience. So in uh, my, okay, let me not get ahead. We'll talk about CVs later. In, if you demonstrate the skill of managing others, you're going to say, I've got experience or, and or I've got the training and or I've got the qualification and or I've got the certification. That's how you demonstrate the skill. Okay. Now, what you need to do right now. So now we're trying to develop your professional development plan. Go, go to either LinkedIn or search on the internet a supervisor position um, job specification, right? When you, when you found one, look at what the requirements are. All those requirements, they're just asking, do you have the skills for these different things, okay? Forget about the qualifications for now, just look at the skills. Take those skills and next to the, take those skills, write them. If you've got a computer in a Word document, Excel document, if you are writing on paper, write it on paper. For each skill, next to it, say, what experience do you have that speaks to that skill that they're asking for? What, what training have you received that speaks to that, that skill? What qualification do you have that speaks to that skill? And do you have any certification that speaks to that skill? Once you've written that down, then we're gonna be talking about your CV in a couple of slides and it will make sense. So that's you deciding on your career path. And then the I've presented to you the, the what's it called the blueprint on how to develop your professional development plan. So now let's get into specifics and look at your CV and look at how you can be better at interviews and how to gain some of these critical skills. All right, so here's our blueprint. The focus is, the focus when you write your CV is to have specific and measurable presentation of your skills. That's it. That's the secret. If you go look at your CV right now, if you're writing generic CVs, they'll never be specific, they'll never be measurable, and they'll never be relevant to every position that, that, that you're applying for. So if you're serious that, okay, this is the position that I want, go read the job spec, extract what, what are the skills that they're looking for. And now you're gonna write a CV that is specific, measurable, and, and uh, sorry, that is specific and measurable presentation of your skills. So how are we gonna do that? Now, I'm gonna start, let's make one example, managing others. So to be a supervisor, you need to demonstrate the skill that you have managed others, all right? So in your CV, say you are working for XYZ, uh, um, for, uh, XYZ PTY Limited, a company, we're gonna call the company XYZ PTY Limited. So you're working for this company and you've been working for this company for the past five years. Now, in that five years that you've worked, you've worked in that company, you've heard P, uh, either it can either be um, uh, artisan assistants or general laborers, or whatever, who you have directed on how to do specific work, right? So, from the org structure, sometimes you find that they're not really a direct report, but by mere fact that you are the artisan in charge or whatever then these people listen to you or take your instruction, right? So for the mere fact that they are taking your instruction and they're listening to you and you're directing them on how to do work, then you are managing others. So that's an experience. So in your CV, you need to write because one of the requirements for supervisor is you need to demonstrate or you need to have a skill of managing others. You will write on your CV, I managed uh, or I managed or I directed the activities of five uh, general workers. Um, you, so you see, now you are being specific. You have managed the activities or the tasks or the people, and these people were general workers, and there were five of them during my time as a 
senior artisan at XYZ company between this year and this year, right? Part of my role as, uh, part of my role of managing these people was to, to give them instruction on the tasks that they need to complete, managing their hours, managing their leave, managing their training, right? leading them, directing them on uh, what, what they need to be doing. So you do have experience. The problem is that when you write your CV is you're not writing your CV in a measurable way, in a specific way. You just say uh, artisan and you're applying for a supervisor position, but you're not specific on what, ex what uh, how, how you've gained the skill of managing others. So that's the experience part of managing others. Now, if you look at this, the way that we've um, um, presented this, um, this, this high level um, approach, right? When you write your CV, I will write the CV from certification backwards to experience. What do I mean? The first thing on your CV on top, right? It will be your name and some of your, info, your contact information, your email, your phone number, things like your ID numbers and, mm -hmm. Um, whether you're married or you're not married, then they're neither here nor there, right? So you want to put the how they need to contact you. Then there will be a section of like your summary of your career or whatever. So let's leave that for now. We'll talk about that later. The next session that you need to have is certification, all right? Now, when it comes to managing others, is there a certification that you can get to demonstrate that you can manage others? Right. So at artisan level, maybe, maybe, maybe not, you know, because because um, I would be thinking of things like, you know, PMP and um, PR, the PR, because part of PR, uh, PR and your PR tech, whatever, is to um, what to call is an element of, you know, managing activities and managing projects and whatever. So maybe there's no certification on managing others that is relevant to you as an artisan at artisan level, and i.e. you are at N4 um, or N6, okay? So let's leave certification. Let's look at qualification. Now, qualification, right? Your If there's a module in your, artisan, in your N3, N4 that speaks to uh, management, then that, that, that talks to your skill of managing others. Right. So in your CV, you write certification, list your certification. If you don't have certifications, don't include it. Next up, qualifications. Put your qualifications. All right. Now, as an addendum or an annexure, put your the what you call your your academic record because your academic record will break down what your qualification covered. And when someone looks at your academic record, they can see, oh, okay, he's, man he's done a course on managing others. All right, so that's qualification. Let's look at training. Next thing that you're gonna put in is training. Why? Because training also speaks to what? The skills. So if you are finding it difficult to demonstrate that you've managed others, the one simplest shortcut way you can do it is just doing a course on managing others. So this course can be a course where you are physically going to go to, a, I don't know, like a venue and the course title is managing others or supervisor management or whatever. Um, you can do an online course where at the end of the online course, you get a, a, an attendance certificate, whatever the case may be. You do those trainings, you put them in your CV. Bah. Right. So when someone is looking at this CV and says, look, one thing that I'm looking for in my supervisor is that they need to have the skill to manage others. All right. And then the experience part, when you write your CV, then you will you you will emphasize on situations where you managed others. And when you emphasize on situations when you where you managed others, you need to be very specific. Right. You need to give the, the who, the what. Right, the amounts to say, I had five people uh, who I was, if they were not reporting to you, but you were managing their activities, I had five people who I was managing their activities and their work at the workplace. All right, so those five people, these are the things that I did. I gave them instructions on what work they need to do, approved their work, um, 
Eric directed them um, on how to complete their work and so forth and so forth, right? So now you have in your CV demonstrated that you have the skill of managing others. Now, you take this example that I just made and you look at all the different skills. Look at all the different skills. And from all those different skills, you start breaking, the, breaking them down the way I've broken them down with this example of managing others. Now, the only difference now is if a specific skill does not, like there's no certification or qualification or training linked to it, there's nothing wrong with that. What's important is that for all the skills that they need for a specific position, make sure that you have one of the four things over there. All right. Right. So that's the CV. Now, on the CV, again, comes the issue of qualifications. Now, the reason why qualifications is a requirement um, is because with a qualification, there's there's certain skills that are assumed to be in place with that qualification. So if you get a position, an, ad, an advertised position for the GMR 2.1, which is asking, uh, which is saying, no, we want this GMR 2.1 to have a bachelor's in mechanical or electrical engineering, and they must have a GCC factories, and we will not consider anyone with an N6 uh, with an N6 and a GCC factories. The reason for that is because the employer has already identified to say, listen, for this position, these specific skills that are attached to having a bachelor's degree that we want to be in place for this person to be successful in this role. So if you are sitting there with an N6 and you are not getting this GMR 2.1 position, you need to start thinking about what are the skills that any of the certifications, qualifications that my competition has that I do not have? And how can I um, either, number one, um, um, make or highlight these skills through my experience or highlight these skills through my training so that I can get considered. So there is a situation where you with your N6 or national diploma can beat someone which, with a bachelor's um, in mechanical engineering or electrical if your experience is such that it covers a lot of the skills that are required for that role to the point where this guy with the qualification which is you find is just the theoretical knowledge of those skills is not enough for that role. And you, with your experience alone, can, uh, can actually fulfill that role, right? So how do you do this? You write your experience to be specific and measurable. And you write all your skills to be specific and measurable. And you present that in a very methodological way in your CV. Stop wasting space on your CV talking about things that are not measurable and not speaking to the skills that are required for that position. Okay? So if you play basketball, who cares if you play basketball? Don't put it in your CV because playing basketball, you find that it does not speak to the skills that the employer is looking for. Okay, whereas if you were applying to be a basketball player, yes, you, you playing basketball is fantastic. And then you include that in your CV and you demonstrate what skills you have in basketball that will benefit the employer or the team that you're going to be playing for. All right. So, guys, I hope this makes sense when it comes to writing better CVs. So you write better CVs, number one, by the structure. So your structure will be your, your what to call your contact details and who you are. We'll, you'll have a summary of your career. And remember, with the summary of your career, what are you going to talk about? You want to talk about the skills that you've gained that speak to the position that you want. All right? And then you're going to have your certifications, list them, your qualifications, your training, and then you start talking about your experience. Okay. So when I'm reading your when I'm reading your 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 CV and I see that oh he's got a, a what you call he did training 
in uh, managing others, and this is a supervisor position, then already you are scoring brownie points before I even get in, get to experience. Because you find sometimes that you still need that experience, you understand? So you see even in our, in our model over here that training, qualification, and certification are not enough on their own. You still need to use everything that you've gained in your training, qualification, and certification to gain experience, right? And the combination of everything is a specific skill. I hope that makes sense. Now, when it comes to interviews, same story. When you get to an interview and you're asked the question, you need to answer the question in a specific specific and an immeasurable way, okay? Because they're going to ask you specific questions. Have you managed... The, let's look at the supervisor position. How many people have you ever made? Have you managed? Or have you managed people before? Then when you are presenting yourself in, in the interview, you will present yourself the way I've been I've, I've, I've spoken about in the previous slide to say, listen, um, uh, have I managed uh, people before? Or do you have, because the question of have you managed people before is basically a question asking, do you have the skill of managing others? Right? So how you answer that is, Certification, do you have any, some sort of, so you're going to answer that question backwards, looking at certification, qualification, training, and then say, with the certification or qualification or training that I've gained, I have now been able to successfully manage five people and in this department, and part of me managing them it has been managing conflict, managing their tasks, their activities, their leave, their uh, you know, uh, approving their work and so forth. You understand? And that's how you will present yourself in an interview to say, this is how um, my specific uh, my specific skill on managing others speaks to your question on how do am I able to manage other people? Um, I hope that makes a lot of sense. So I can make a lot of examples when it comes to this matter of skills and how to present skills during your, in your CV and how to present skills in your certification. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share two links. I'm gonna share a link um, that speaks to the, the CVs and how to, to structure your CV and another link on how to write a laser focus CV that follows this sort of methodology, all right? So I'll share those links shortly. So, Gaining critical skills, All right? So I think by now, by now you, you, you sort of catched on, right? The one question, or one, there was a one session that I've uh, mentoring session that I've done, and and it's in that mentoring session. There's a question that came up, which is a question that comes up with, from a lot of people, which says, um, "Look, I'm trying to apply for this position." And in this position, they're saying to me, I need to have a uh, three years experience in management. How am I going to get three years experience in management if no one gives me an opportunity to manage uh, for three years, All right? And my simple answer to that is that you are not understanding what they are actually asking. And even the people who are asking, they actually don't even understand themselves what they are trying to ask, okay? What they're trying to ask is, do you have the skill uh, in terms of the depth and the breadth, the depth and the breadth of that skill of managing people that you we won't have any problems or any issues and you will be able to handle all those problems and all those issues, okay? So what you need to be doing, okay, is not to confine yourself in the experience part. You need to break it down and say, what exactly are these skills? and Am I am I gonna be am I gonna be able to fulfill these skills um, through training, through qualification, through certification? Let me make an example. The same example that I I made to one of these mentees. I said, okay, so we with the mentee we went through the whole process of okay, these are the career paths, right? Of these career paths, which path? do you want to choose, okay? So they chose to say, okay, I want to be a design engineer and I want to be, okay, I want to be a design engineer. So it was broad, design engineer. Okay, perfect, all right. So you've chosen, you want to be a design engineer, right? 
which design, what, what design engineer, because now you're a mechanical engineer, graduate mechanical engineer, and in mechanical engineering, you can be a design engineer for piping, for pressure vessels, HVAC, small water, uh, what to call, um, uh, wet services. So there's a lot of design work that you can do. Which design work do you want to do? Okay, I wanna do, I wanna be an HVAC design engineer. Okay, perfect. So we're getting more specific, right? So you've been working for three years, all right? And you have zero experience in HVAC design. And with these three years that you've been working with no experience in HVAC design, you are competing with people who possibly have the three years, uh, plus more, three years and more, and you, 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 you can't demonstrate this HVAC design experience. Okay. When they are recruiting for an HVAC design position, what are they looking for? Okay, right. So they want to know, number one, do you know what software do you use for HVAC design? Okay, auto, uh, what you call MEP, um, there's uh, Rivet, you name them, all right? There's all these softwares, all right? Do you know what it takes to do an HVAC sizing? Okay. So to do HVAC sizing, you need to understand the build, the building profile. You need to understand the heat loads, blah, 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 blah. Okay, perfect. Now, of all the things that they are looking for, let's start with the understand, knowing how to do heat loads, okay? You've got a bachelor's degree, a qualification in mechanical engineering. Did you do a course in thermal systems? Yes, all right? So you do have a skill on doing load calculation, heat load calculation, because that's the skill that you need for HVAC design, okay? All right, tick. Do you have, a, do, you, do, you, do you know how to use the software? No, I don't know how to use the software. Here's the beautiful thing with living in the digital age. You can learn how to use the software, number one, from YouTube, free of charge, okay? You can get the software on a 30-day trial to learn how to use it. If you are a student, you can get the software free of charge by virtue of being a student, okay? You can, um, what you call, with a 30-day trial, okay, you can do, a, a enroll on a 100 rand or 150 rand uh, online course from one of the platforms, okay? You can learn um, this course, uh, this, this, um, what to call this this software by just try and error just getting the free version and learning the and learning the software that my friend once you've gone through all of that that is you've learned the skill okay so the only thing now that's missing is you using the skill on do on actual work so how can, what can you do all right one of the things that i've done to because when I wanted, my, my goal was to be a boiler engineer, to be a boiler specialist. And one of the biggest barrier, because I was working for rainwater and I was only doing um, like water design projects and I don't have this boiler experience, right? So I've got this huge uh, barrier of saying, I don't have the experience. So what did I do? Very simple. What is a boiler, what does a boiler engineer do? They do heat load calcs, they do this, they do the thermal modeling and so forth. Okay, sharp, right, let me learn how to do that. Now, from there, can I develop my own mock project, all right? A mock project where I apply all these skills. So by mock project, I mean, I take a real life situation, right? And then from the real life situation, I take the skills that I've learned, and then from the skills that I've learned, then I, uh, what you call, I apply them in this mock project and I put it on my CV as a mock project. Who said that can be done? Who said that can be done? It's a skill, it's, it's experience, okay? So an example with the my HVAC mentee, very simple. How many buildings, there's buildings all over the place, all right? There's buildings with, the building that I'm in right now has an HVAC system on its own. What's stopping you from going to a building, uh, create your own mock project, go to the building, uh, take the profile of the building, start doing heat load calculation, 
go to the business owner and say, listen, I did hit low calculation on your HVAC system. And this is what I, I, I got. Can I check the data plates of the HVAC system that you, you have installed to see if they talk to my design? Okay. And then you look at it. Oh yeah, it talks to my design. So I know how to do this thing. Okay. So who's stopping you from doing that even on a Saturday? So this whole thing of, I don't have the experience. It, it, it holds people captive because now you are thinking, okay, for me to gain the experience, I need to go physically work for somebody to physically do that thing. Whereas gaining experience can also be gained during the weekend exactly how, exactly how I have explained it, okay? Now, I'm gonna make one last example on critical skills. Again, with my own situation where I had to demonstrate, I had to gain a skill of uh, managing others. Okay. So, what I ended up doing was okay, so how can I gain the skills? Well, I started being involved in, um, you know, the Black Management Forum, being involved in um, the Young Professionals Forum. Okay. And then in the Black Management Forum, in the uh, young, uh, young Professionals Forum, I, 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 I uh, ran for uh, leadership positions, okay? Then once I've got, got into those leadership positions, remember, if you're in these forums and you're in the leadership pro positions, you are in charge of uh, defining the activities of the, of the forum. You are in charge of defining the tasks of other team members who are in the forum, right? So you see how you going to a non-profit organization, you can go and learn specific skills that you can again put in your CV. Who said you can't put experience from a non-profit organization that speaks to the position that you're applying for? So if you want to demonstrate that you are able to lead people, you are able to manage people, joining a nonprofit organization, running for leadership positions there, so that you are, you are able to be in a position where you can lead other people and manage other people is one way of doing it. Who said that can be done? Okay. So this whole talk of uh, experience, I hope I've addressed. I hope you understand now that what employers are looking for is skills. I hope you understand that to gain a skill is a combination of experience, training, qualifications, and certification. I hope you understand that you should not use the barriers of not being exposed to a specific employer or a specific industry not to gain the experience. So if you are sitting, um, for example, in an FMCG and you want to move to mining, there's nothing stopping you from gaining what the, 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 the sort of experience and the knowledge and the training for mining that one day when you apply for a position in mining, you can demonstrate to them to say, in as much as I haven't necessarily worked in the mine, but here's what I have done. If I'm sitting there as an employer, I'm looking at you and saying, look, you really want to be here. Okay, you really want to you really want to have this position. And by virtue of your willpower, I can give you a chance. And now when you get that chance, what do you do? You use your training qualification certification and whatever mock experience that you've gained to thrive in that position. And the employer will feel like, yeah, you know what? I did not make a mistake with this guy. Guys, that's the blueprint. Okay, so we've addressed our, the issue of how to develop, to do your developmental, uh, how to address your developmental gaps. And to address your developmental gaps, I'm saying to you, do not confine yourself to the, the, the way you are working now. Do not confine yourself. If you are unemployed right now, do not confine, even when you are unemployed, you can use this same methodology because if you've got a phone, for a mere fact that you are watching this, um, you are watching this this thing on your this session on your Facebook or on your YouTube, by virtue of that alone, means that you've got a device that 
can actually allow you to gain some sort of training through online courses or whatever you understand and what we'll do is if you if you uh, what you call go to our website you go to um, scroll all the way down subscribe to our mailing list we will share more information on ways of gaining gaining some of these skills go to our website you check our blog we'll be sharing more information on our blog page on how to gain these skills so you'll see if you go to our website you click blog and then on the blog when you filter just filter professional development we'll be sharing a lot of information there on how to gain some of these um, skills through training qualification and certification and mind you certification is the, the what we, uh, what you call we specialize in which is the gcc factories and now moving into gcc mines and work and soon through other certification and then qualification you can get from registered quality from registered institution training you can also get from us you know just be on the lookout um, i'm going to share a link to our online course platform where we'll be loading a lot of these online courses where after the online course you will get an attendance certificate that you can plug into your cv and what we do with our online courses is that we we want them to have a project where you after you've gone through the content you do an assessment you attach your project and then once you've attached your project we give you an attendance certificate you know because with the project it feeds to what the experience because that project will be a mock project that tries to evaluate your experience and once you've evaluated your experience you can put that in your cv I hope you understand. All right. So we've covered our session four and we're done for today's session. So at this point, I'll take some questions. All right, so I see there's some guy who's taking chances here. Busy advertising nonsense. All right, guys, are they...